Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, the webinar in education use and alternatives. Um, we, to start off, we would like for uh, our attendees to type in their name, organization that they're from, and the role or position that they hold within that organization. My name is Jan Carlin, and I am part of the Partnership to Improve Dementia Care here in Oregon. And we thank you for spending your lunch hour to listen and participate in this webinar where we hope you will get full information on dementia. This is the second of a series of three webinars that discuss non-pharmacological and appropriate pharmacological when supporting a person living with dementia. In this webinar, Elizabeth Ekstrom will discuss when antipsychotic medications are not appropriate. And then on October 9th, Dr. Maureen Nash, Medical Director of Providence Elder Place, will present on the circumstances when antipsychotic medications are appropriate. If you haven't registered for this webinar, we hope that you will do so immediately following this one. These webinars are being recorded and will be available in about a week after the presentation. And because these webinars are being recorded, we ask that you call in call in with a phone number that's been an access code that have been provided. It just makes the recording uh, so much better. These webinars are brought to you by the Oregon Partnership to Improve Dementia Care. The partnership consists of representatives of the Oregon Healthcare Association, Leading Age Oregon, Department of Human Services, Oregon, Providence, the Alzheimer's Association. We are also fortunate to have Terry Fagan, pharmacy, and Cy Simonson, consultant pharmacist, on our team as well. From care settings to decrease the use of antipsychotic medication with the diagnosis of dementia. These are powerful tools for the most part do not improve the well-being of the person living with dementia. The goal of these webinars is to emphasize the importance of appropriate assessment and how adopting a person-centered approach to care can enhance their lives. I'm happy to introduce to you Elizabeth Ekstrom, MD. Dr. Ekstrom is an associate professor of geriatrics at Oregon Health Science and University. She received her MD at the University of Wisconsin and completed her residency and fellowship at as well as a MPH through the University of Washington. <clears throat> she practices both primary care and This is on promoting a healthy lifestyle in older adults <clears throat> and educating all health professionals older adults. Dr. Ekstrom also co-directs the OHSU's Healthy Aging Alliance. After Dr. Ekstrom's presentation, there will be a short question and answer period. When the webinar is over, you will receive an invitation asking you to evaluate the webinar to give us some feedback on today's presentation. With that, I welcome Dr. Elizabeth Ekstrom. Elizabeth, go ahead. All right, thanks, Jan. And thanks for joining us today for the second in the three-part series on management of dementia, which is supported by Partnership to Improve Dementia Care. If any of you haven't had the opportunity to see Liz Von Welt, I would encourage you to watch the audio presentation as it has lots of valuable information. Today we're going to talk about when and how to avoid antipsychotics in patients with dementia and symptoms. I have no disclosures to report. Three patients. Mr. Smith has been hitting, especially when helped to the bathroom. Mr. Jones is anxious and withdrawn after a hospitalization. And Mrs. That she see her mother. To start with Mr. Smith, he's 84, Alzheimer's dementia for several years. He lives in a memory care facility and needs help with all of his activities of daily living except for eating. His wife lives nearby in assisted living and spend, spends much time with him. Staff notes he's been coming, becoming more paranoid, and Mrs. Smith admits that he hit her several times when she tried to help him to the bathroom. He's starting to fall and having a harder time getting him up as he no longer speaks in full sentences and has become incontinent. He's been spitting out his food and his lungs in the last several months. 
Begin to examine Mr. Smith and notice growing agitation when you examine his stomach and legs. You ask when Mr. Smith has been in it is with toileting and transferring. You ask if he had osteoarthritis or other pain in the past, and Mrs. Smith remembers he used to complain of his back and his knees. He doesn't complain now, and he doesn't take any pills. Patients with dementia often cannot express They just feel distressed and may show this by hitting, refusing assistance, or stopping eating. If we don't figure out they have pain and treat it appropriately, their distress will simply worsen. I always recommend doing a thorough pain history the first time you meet a patient, either at a visit to your clinic or upon admission to a long-term care facility, and if at all possible, before he develops dementia. Of course, this is not all, always possible, and if the patient already has dementia, you'll need to speak with family members to try to elicit a pain history. Ask about back pain, or headaches, neuropathy, anything that the patient suffered from in the past. Also, try to find out what has worked for the pain in the past. Tylenol is the best pain medicine for older adults, but if a patient has had success with non drugs, gabapentin, or other drugs in the past, it's important to elicit this. If the patient is exhibiting new distress and there is no clear reason for the possible pain, do a very careful exam. Check their ears, check their mouth, arms, legs, feet, and hands. Check for urinary retention, constipation. Could this even be a urinary tract infection? I had a patient who was brought in for an urgent visit after two days of hitting out at her facility. The facility had not been able to get close to her and she'd not been cleaned in two days. With gentle attention, I was able to remove her shirt. I found that her arm was bruised and severely swollen, a broken arm. This is an extreme example, but indicative of the importance of ensuring that you do a careful exam for somebody who has new There are many, many reasons that people with dementia might have pain, and oftentimes we don't think of all of them. They might have DJD, spinal compression fractures, pressure ulcers, peripheral vascular disease, and many things that you can see here on this list. However, it's often impossible to get an accurate story about where the pain is, the pain is, what makes it better or worse, or any of the other typical questions that we taking a pain history. So for pain dementia, it's important to look for nonverbal pain cues, such as vocalization, grimacing, bracing, and agitation. As you're performing your physical exam, watch carefully for any of these findings. They help you determine the site of the pain. This is a nice scale for pain assessment in advanced dementia. If your patient is not able to articulate pain or any other reason for the distress, I would encourage you to use this scale to try to determine the severity of the possible pain as that will help guide treatment. So if you think your patient's behavior is due to pain, first try to fix it. If they have an abnormal ear exam, urinary retention, constipation, or mouth redness, you've got a good reason and can hopefully get the problem fixed. Try logic strategies. Sometimes pain in dementia is generalized because of sitting too long. Get your patients up and moving and do frequent position changes with them. Use a heating pad or hot water, bo hot, hot water bottle for 20 minutes at least three times daily. Gentle mis soothing and help to relieve pain in patients with dementia. If the non-pharmacologic strategies don't work and you think the pain is from arthritis or something else, that's not fixable, I recommend starting with Tylenol, 650 milligrams, three times daily. And I always recommend scheduling this because dementia patients have so little ability to acknowledge when they have pain. If this seems to be helping but not providing maximum benefit, increase to 1,000 milligrams, three times daily, scheduled. If the pain seems location, such as neck, back, or knees, consider using diclofenac gel or a lidocaine patch. Not systemically absorbed and very safe for older people, though sometimes insurance coverage can be a problem with both of them. Lidocaine patches cost upward of $6 per patch and a 100-gram tube of diclofenac gel.
is about $70. So what about NSAIDs in patients with dementia? Well, I think we've all learned to be a little bit afraid of NSAIDs because of their potential side effects, and they probably aren't as safe as Tylenol. They have side effects related to stomach, kidney, and blood pressure problems. They are safer than narcotics, and reasonably good studies show that they lead to fewer fractures, less acute kidney injury, and less hospitalizations and deaths than narcotics. So if your patient is not in kidney failure, meaning that they have an estimated glomerular filtration rate greater than 30 or greater than 45 to be extra safe, they don't have uncontrolled congestive heart failure or hypertension, and they haven't had a GI bleed, they may be a reasonable uh, consideration for an NSAID. I like to use naproxen as my first line treatment, 250 milligrams twice daily, again scheduled. Ibuprofen can also be another possible solution. Check their kidney function after a week or two and monitor them for blood pressure problems and for edema. Notably, salt restriction usually prevents edema in patients who are taking NSAIDs. So what if these aren't good? Well, if you've got pretty good evidence that pain is the issue and other strategies haven't fully worked, the patient is clearly suffering and distressed, now is the time to try low-dose opioids. I try to observe the patient for times when they're most distressed and schedule the drugs for those times, such as one hour prior to assistance or a physical therapy visit. If the distress is around the clock, you're going to have to schedule drugs to cover all times. General principles for opioid use start low and gradually increase. A lot of us use morphine for our older patients, and this is extremely important to avoid if your patient has poor kidney function. So that's a note of special warning around the use of morphine, except at the end of life. I recommend completely avoiding methadone and tramadol, as the side effects of these medications are extraordinarily high for older people. Monitor closely, especially during the first few doses, for dizziness, confusion, anything that might be a drug side effect. Do check the kidney function after a week or so, and then recheck the pain scales and behaviors frequently to see if your narcotics are helping, and discontinue the drug if your patient does not seem to show any improvement in their distress. Again, always schedule these drugs. Dementia patients do not have the ability to ask for pain medications as needed. I tend to start with a half a tablet to one tablet daily up to three times daily of Vicodin, or if the pain seems more significant, I might try oxycodone 2.5 milligrams once daily up to four times daily. I try not to increase the dose for at least a week because I really want to see how effective my starting dose is going to be with patients. But if they are still having pain that isn't completely relieved, I will go ahead and do some gradual dose increases till I um, get benefit without and if a patient has acute, severe pain, Dilaudid is probably going to be your drug of choice. I already mentioned that morphine is very dangerous in people with poor kidney function, and fentanyl also has um, very uh, kind of infrequent um, use for older people just because it has very uh, absorption and everything. So you're probably going to want to choose hydromorphone if you need acute, uh, severe pain management. All right, so let's go back to Mr. Smith. He's been hitting out when the care team attempts to assist him with his activities of daily living. He has a history of back and knee pain. Think for a moment, what would you like to do? Well, let's start simple. Daily activity, frequent position changes, use a heating pad or a hot water bottle, schedule some Tylenol, and maybe try some diclofenac gel between, before his ADLs and his activity. If those steps don't solve the problem, the next thing would probably be to go ahead and try an NSAID. He doesn't have any absolute contraindications to that, and his pain is such that an NSAID might be a valuable treatment choice for him. So I probably would schedule some Aleve and check his kidney function in a week or so to see whether he was going to tolerate it okay. If still no response and you still think his symptoms might be due to pain, then I might go ahead and try adding in the Vicodin before his ADLs or maybe BID scheduled. You'll recall that I 
reported he was having the most agitation before his ADLs. So you might be able to get away with a dose or two an hour before doing those. Oxycodone would be another place to try for this patient two times daily or three times daily. This website is a nice resource for pain in older patients and you can go there for lots of ways to help uh, manage pain in your patients with dementia. Okay, I'm going to move on to Mr. Jones who, um, as you recall, has Alzheimer's disease and is anxious and withdrawn after a hospitalization. So Fred's got multiple issues. He's got Alzheimer's, he's got congestive heart failure, coronary disease, osteoarthritis, omnia, diabetes, BPH, and an estimated creatinine uh, GFR of 28, which puts him in stage 4 kidney disease. And he's on a whole host of meds, denepazil, digoxin at a high dose, metoprolol, lisinopril, aspirin, simvastatin, acetaminophen, tramadol, zolpidem, metformin, gliburide, and tamsulosin. So when you're starting to think about your patients and their medications, the first thing to be aware of is how to calculate estimated GFR. And I always recommend using the cockroft galt formula for people over 80. Many of our hospitals and clinics, labs, report the MDRD, which overestimates kidney function about 50% of the time in older adults. Rather, the cockroft galt formula much more accurately estimates GFR in people for, who are over 80, and that's the formula that you're going to want to use. Um, it's easy to find at nephron.com or other websites, and you can plug that in quickly and get a, a much better indication of their eGFR compared to using the MDRD. And if you think about various um, levels of CKD, you have to be cautious about Oh, a GFR of about 60, you need to reduce dosages or stop drugs like dabigatran, metformin, morphine, as I've already talked about, um, colchicine. Um, as you get lower, you need to be stopping the NSAIDs. Um, and down below 30, there are a lot more drugs that you need to be stopping, including the bisphosphonates, the thiazide diuretics, tramadol, allopurinol has to be dose reduced all the way down to 100, usually a day, and memantine has to be dose reduced. Fred already has a lot of medications, but to top it all off, on Cipro for a UTI. So just thinking about urinary tract infections, Cipro is a drug that gets used very commonly, but it does have a drug that it should not be used for a routine UTI because it is, has so many troubles with delirium and then also tendinopathies. So we really should be reserving Cipro. Um, carefully. Uh, TMP sulfa at a single strength dosage of 80 slash 400 might be a reasonable choice for his UTI, but you do have to be careful about um, kidney function, um, checking in INR and potassium. Nitrofurantoin is a drug that we used to think could not be used in anyone who had a GFR less than 60, but newer data does show that, it's, that it can be effective in that population and may be used all the way down to a GFR of 30. So what I've highlighted here are the drugs that are probably dangerous for Fred at this point in time. The drugs in yellow are the maybe dangerous ones, and the drugs in red are the seriously dangerous ones. And as you can see, it's the majority of his medication list. So it's very possible that his delirium is being caused by the medications that he's been taking. Anticholinergics, anti-inflammatory agents, benzos, cardiovascular drugs, diuretics, the histamine blockers, lithium and opioids are the drugs that have the highest rate of causing delirium in older adults. But don't forget some of the withdrawal syndromes as well from drugs like Paxil and then of course alcohol. And we frequently forget about the anticholinergic properties of these somewhat commonly used drugs. And I have to say that for most of these drugs we should probably take them right off our list. I certainly do use some ipatropium, but I try to avoid most of the rest of these drugs in my older patients, all possible. So what should you use instead? Well, for nausea, there's suggestive evidence that ondansetron is better. And this is really the only 
nausea medication that I use in older adults. For sleep, unfortunately, no drugs are truly safe in older people. Try a back rub, warm milk, and relaxing music. This has been studied in the hospital setting and shown to improve sleep, even in a busy hospital environment. Rumelteon may help improve the sleep-wake cycle and has some limited evidence showing that it can reduce the risk of development. Trazodone is mildly anticholinergic, but at low doses might be an effective sleep aid without causing side effects. When you're thinking of reflux, you really want to limit it to PPIs and to the shortest course possible. As you saw from the previous slide, H2 blockers have a high rate of anticholinergic. Um, the PPIs also have some problems themselves, including issues with uh, pneumonia and bone density. But if you can use them for a short amount of time, they're going to be your safest choice in older adults. And then sertraline or citalopram are going to be your first line choices if a patient is complaining of anxiety or you have a dementia patient who seems to be anxious or depressed. About that in just a moment. So for Fred, his denepazil is dose reduced. He's still got some coronary disease symptoms um, and congestive heart failure, so we need to continue his metoprolol and lisinopril. For his osteoarthritis, we've stopped his tramadol and left him just on acetaminophen, stopped his zolpidem for insomnia, stopped his type 2 diabetes medications because he's quite elderly and his uh, hemoglobin A1C has been running in about the 8 range, so he probably doesn't need to take the medications anymore, and stopped his tansilosin. Luckily for Fred, this cheered him up a lot. He had no more delirium or any more struggles to get him to take his pills. So this was a big success story. Okay, we're going to move on to our last patient, Mrs. Black. So she's 89, and she's also had Alzheimer's dementia for about 10 years. Her husband continues to care for her at home, but lately has been increasingly concerned about her. She's been demanding her mother and when Mr. Black tells her that her mother is dead. She's been refusing to eat and is starting to wander at night. So what do you think she has? Well, she's probably got depressive symptoms or even major depressive disorder. There are very high prevalence rates of depression in dementia, and the prevalence increases the more severe the dementia gets. So this graph shows that for people with the um, best MMSE scores, kind of 25 to 30 in the left-hand bar, um, even with the best MMSE scores, the depression rates are around 25%. But as you go to the right on the graph, up to uh, the most severe dementia of, with MMSE scores of 13 down to zero, you can see that the depression rate increases almost up to 50%. But not every case is major depression. There might be symptoms of depression without it meeting the criteria for major depression. Apathy is very common. Anxiety, guilt, hopelessness, and suicidality can often help differentiate true major depression from apathy. If your patient is still able to answer questions, you might use the geriatric depression scale as a good measure of depression um, in dementia. However, if your patient is much more seriously impaired, the Cornell scale for depression in dementia is the scale that's able for you to use. And this is what the Cornell depression in dementia scale looks like. The caregiver rates symptoms and signs that have occurred during the week before the interview. And they rate all of these various things. I could only get part of the scale on the slide, but you can easily Google it and see it for yourself, including mood-related signs, behavioral disturbances, and other things that are very common in people who have depression in dementia. What about treating depression in dementia? Well, interestingly, there have been a number of negative trials recently suggesting that period of non-drug interventions might be valuable to try in your patients and then reassess them. However, most of us who see these patients and note a change in their symptoms affecting quality of life and caregiver stress will go ahead and initiate an SSRI. Sertraline is my go-to drug for depression and I start at 25 milligrams, titrating every two weeks or so up to a maximum dose of 100 milligrams. 
I recognize that the patient may not have full effectiveness for as much as 8 to 12 weeks, and I will often go to 50 milligrams and stay there for about 8 weeks to see if they're going to have effectiveness. But I always try to start low to mitigate any risk of side effects. Citalopram starting at 10 milligrams and titrating up to 20 milligrams if needed is another good choice for antidepressants. This is a long list of symptoms, um, but it's demarcation of what is more responsive to medications and what is less responsive to medications. So if your patient is primarily concerned about anxiety, delusions, hallucinations, insomnia, hyperactivity, those kinds of things, medications can often be effective for them. However, if your patient is exhibiting perseverative yelling, pacing, exit-seeking, disrobing, sexual impulsivity, and other symptoms, these are often less responsive to medications. This is unfortunate because it is often these symptoms that are the most distressing. Um, but I would refer you back to Liz von Welsheim's prior webinar to get um, some tips on how to manage some of these distressing symptoms. SSRIs are going to require a trial of at least two weeks or longer to see any effectiveness, and as I mentioned, might require eight to 12 weeks for full effectiveness. Once in a while, you may need to use an antipsychotic or to start off when your patient is very depressed, because if they're having acute distress, the SSRI may not kick in soon enough to give them good relief. Dr. Nash is going to talk in a few more weeks on the use of antipsychotics in patients with dementia. I try not to use antipsychotics when I think my patient is depressed. However, if they're exhibiting very distressing, agitative, sorrowful, and self, uh, self uh, pain or uh, painful behaviors, then I might need to use a brief course while I'm waiting for my SSRI to kick in. This graphic just shows some of, the, some of the times to use various medications in symptomatic approaches. We're focused today on the antidepressants, which can help with irritability, agitation or verbal aggression, anxiety, and dysphoria. The acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which I haven't talked about much, um, can be helpful for some um, symptoms of depression, such as apathy, hallucinations, misperceptions, confusion, and inattention. We've already talked about the importance of the analgesics in, my, in managing symptomatic behaviors in dementia. And Dr. Nash was, is going to talk more about the time when antipsychotics might be needed. So in summary, when a patient with dementia is agitated, think about pain, delirium, drug side effects or interactions, and depression as likely reasons for the agitation. None of the patients we've discussed today, or others like them, should receive antipsychotics. And treating the underlying etiologies is much more effective than treating symptoms with an antipsychotic. So I've left plenty of time for questions, because I know that many of you have patients that you and some of the things I've said may have felt like they were so I wanted to be sure that everybody has the option to ask questions, and I think Jan is going to help get those to me because I haven't seen any questions appear in the little chat box that's on my frame. So Jan, if you could help us um, get started with some questions, that would be great. Well, one question is uh, there was a question that came up about heating pads. They thought they were dangerous for uh, people who... I think you may have mentioned that in one of your earlier slides. Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, heating pads, you, you do have to be careful with heating pads. Some people have very fragile skin, and of course, you know, many older people, especially those with dementia, aren't going to remember to turn it off. So if you're going to use a heating pad, you need to have one that turns itself automatically, turns itself off automatically, and also one that has quite low settings so that you don't, it doesn't get too hot for your patient. Um, uh, it's also really important to consider patients who might have Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia because these patients often have some temperature dysregulation and the heating pad can get their core body temperature up too high. But for many of our patients, a uh, low temperature, 
kind of shorter acting heating pad can be extremely effective for pain and is also very soothing. Um, sometimes a hot water bottle is a little safer approach. Sometimes even just ha being able to get a warmed up blanket and put that over the patient can be a nice soothing approach um, to get some heat. But uh, if if you can do a heating pad safely, then um, it can be a remarka remarkably helpful approach um, to non-pharmacologic management of pain. But I'm, I'm glad somebody asked that question because it is something that you do want to be very careful about. Yeah. Another question came in about uh, whether or not you would suggest melatonin for sleep, and if so, at what dose? Yeah, great question. So um, I I do use some melatonin for sleep. Melatonin doesn't necessarily make you fall asleep, but when you use it on a regular basis at the same time, it can help to reset your clock a little bit and can make sleep a little bit better. And if you if you're thinking particularly about dementia patients, clock disruption is extremely so melatonin makes sense to use. So what I tell patients or family members or write orders at the facility is to give melatonin every night at the same time, and it might be 9 p.m., it might be 8 p.m., it might be 10 p.m., sometime that makes sense to try to get their clock readjusted to. And um, my starting dose is 0.5 milligrams, and I will allow them to go up to um, 1 milligram if the 0.5 isn't effective. I try not to go over 1 milligram. Even at one milligram, you're in a supraphysiologic dose. And so I know a lot of people are using three, six, or even 10 milligram dosages, but really I think it's best to try to stick with kind of those, you know, semi physiologic doses of melatonin of about 0.5 to 1. But it can be an effective way to get the sleep cycle back on track a little bit. And, and if a, if a dementia patient has had a sleep-wake cycle reversal where they're doing most of their sleeping during the day and most of their um, being up and active during the night, um, melatonin is something that I will try to help readjust the clock um, for people. Okay. Another um, I have a patient on hospice with CKD3 on um, metoprolol, behaviors are present. Would you recommend DCing the medication? Um, DCing which medication? I think it's uh, metoprolol. Oh, -E metoprolol? But metro yes, sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, of course. So um, somebody's, if somebody's on hospice, I mean, Metoprolol is used for multiple things, and, and probably in a hospice patient, the only reason I can think of to leave it on is if that patient has intractable anginal symptoms for which you think the metoprolol might be providing some value. It's a terrible blood pressure agent, and you really don't have to worry about blood pressure too much in hospice patients anyway. So if they've been taking it for hypertension for the last 30 years, absolutely, you may stop it. Congestive heart failure, again, if that's kind of been a life prolonging medication for their congestive heart failure, and oftentimes I do titrate that off. I mean, I'll watch to make sure that they don't go into a terrible acute exacerbation of their congestive heart failure, but most people can get off of their beta blockers, off of their lisinopril, off of some of those other agents with absolutely no problem when they're in kind of uh, later end stages of dementia or other reasons they're at the end of life, and those are kind of the life-prolonging treatments for CHF. So again, beta blockers, I tend to leave them on if I really think my patient is suffering from anginal symptoms. They're great antianginals, um, but other things I'll just kind of gradually taper off most of those drugs. I mean, the you know statins are another another classic example that I just I just gently taper them off of those, and there are lots of other drug classes. But for the patient we talked about, it it was absolutely no problem off of his CHF drugs, his BPH drugs. All of those things were, you know, basically not contributing to his quality of life anymore, and he he did not have any trouble coming off of any of those drugs. Okay. <clears throat> Um, there's a question type comment, and that was no mention of the beers list. Do you have anything to say about the beers list at all, Elizabeth? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so the some of the slides I showed were 
drugs that are, you know, kind of the highlights of the beers list, even though I didn't mention it specifically. The anticholinergics, um, the opiates, of course, being cautious with NSAIDs, all of those drugs are on the beers list. And it's a, it's a good guidepost. I think that, um, you know, some people and actually some insurance companies too have decided to kind of turn it into the Bible for older adults and decided that um, you, you're not allowed to give any of those drugs to any older people. And that's probably taking it a step too far. I think there probably are appropriate situations for people to be on some of the drugs on the beers list. Um, I really try to shy away from things with anticholinergic properties. I really try to shy away from um, you know some of the antibiotics that are more likely to cause delirium or you know things like that. But um, but certainly it's a guidepost. And if if your patient has a disease that is, you know, that could be helped by something on the beers list. I, I do use those drugs only. Probably one of the best examples that I just gave in this presentation was the use of NSAIDs. Um, NSAIDs are kind of pretty strongly um, recommended not to use very much on the beers list, but because they have such a better safety profile than the narcotics, I've now been using them for a number of years in, in patients who don't have other contraindications and found them to be extremely effective for managing their musculoskeletal conditions. And if, you know, I have had a 96 year old patient who had, you know, got an acute hip bursitis. Um, didn't want to try an injection first and I gave her a two-week trial of low-dose naproxen and she was completely cured by the end of the two weeks and her kidney function remained absolutely stable through that course. So, I, you know, I think there are reasons to listen to the, uh, to the beers list. They've spent a lot of time and energy developing that, but I also think that at times um, we, we, there are other things that might lead us to use some of the drugs that are on the beers list. Um, I'm going through, I'm checking to see if we have any more questions. I, there was a question about sending out the PowerPoint and I will do that this afternoon. Um, oh, had any experience with acupuncture as pain or symptom dementia patients? Yeah, great question. Um, so, <laughs> I, I wish that there were lots of really great randomized puncture um, because I think it probably does work and I, I wish we had more research to support its use. We really don't. So what I say about acupuncture is more anecdotally based than true research trials. Um, I think that it has, it's been studied for, you know, some complaints. It's been studied for knee pain. There are some places where you can find randomized control trial evidence for the use of acupuncture. Um, but I have to say that you know, for people who are willing to give it a try, um, for some of the you know arthritis type conditions, musculoskeletal pain, and other things like that, I think acupuncture can be a nice adjunctive strategy. Um, I worry a little bit about you know jumping to something like acupuncture before doing a full workup. Um, I've definitely seen people who'd been getting acupuncture for headaches and nobody did a CT scan to see that they actually had a subdural hematoma. Don't let your medical workup be hindered um, in prescribing something like acupuncture, but if it seems like it's a musculoskeletal condition, something that might respond well to acupuncture, I think that is a, a, an excellent choice for a lot of our patients. Okay. Uh, what is your advice regarding dual antidepressant therapy in dementia patients? That's a difficult question. Um, it's it's not something I like to do frequently, but sometimes I think there's a good indication for it, and probably the best indication that I can think of is when I've got a patient who has um, depression but also has sleeplessness tight and um, you know really kind of a, a stirred up situation and for people like that I really like to use mirtazapine 7.5 milligrams so very low dose of mirtazapine about nine o'clock in the evening because it helps with sleep it helps improve appetite but it has only very minimal antidepressant or anti-anxiety anti -anxiety properties at that low, low dose. So 
symptoms, if the patient is also exhibiting significant anxiety or depression, I will also use 25 milligrams of sertraline in the morning. So kind of a baby dose of the SSRI in the morning and a baby dose of the mirtazapine in the evening. And those two work together very nicely um, for patients who are in that situation. And um, oftentimes, you can leave them both at those very low doses and get excellent effectiveness. Um, let's see. I try. I try not to use combinations of, say, an SSRI and venlafaxine or buspirone or things like that. I think we're probably better off titrating our sertraline up to 100 and you know using a higher dose of that drug um, in patients who have you know pretty serious depression and anxiety or citalopram. I don't use as much citalopram these days partly because it just doesn't have as wide a dosing range. 20 milligrams is supposed to be the max now for our patients over 65 and I've um, seen some side effects. I really try to stick with that dosage, um, so I lean. I do lean more towards the sertraline. I think it probably has a little more energizing properties as well. So I really like lean in my patients who have um, depression, whether or not they have uh, dementia as well. Okay, I have kind of. <clears throat> let's see, two two more questions here. Would you recommend Diva La Diva? Dival Proex for a 94-year-old man having hallucinations who could potentially have Charles Bonnet syndrome. Ah, great question. So Dival Proex acid or um, uh, Depakote is its brand name. Um, and Charles, I'll talk about, I'll say what Charles Bonnet syndrome is first because that's that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, Charles Bonnet is visual hallucinations that are due to vision impairment. So um, it's and it's kind of like tinnitus with hearing impairment. Um, people who have impairments, um, our brains tend to not like empty space, and so they will actually create something to fill the space. So if we've got macular degeneration and have very poor vision, our brains might start to create visual hallucinations to put something in that empty space. If we have poor hearing, our brains might start to put tinnitus or you know we'll hear bells ringing or some people hear a symphony orchestra, um, but our brains are trying to put something into that empty space. And um, that was first characterized by a guy named Charles Bonnet um, for the visual disturbance and the visual hallucinations that occur with macular degeneration. Um, so, and so the question is, you know, is it disturbed? Some people don't mind their visual hallucinations or their symphony that might be playing. Um, I had a 93-year-old lady who her hallucination, interestingly enough, was of a dog. And sitting next to her, she had terrible macular degeneration, especially in her right eye. The dog was always on her right side. And um, that uh, that hallucination was, was quite charming for her. And she had insight to know that she didn't even have to feed him or take him for a walk or anything. He was just a companion and she loved it. Um, so if if it's if the hallucination is not distressing, I would definitely not recommend treating it. If the hallucination is distressing, I would probably actually use an antipsychotic. And um, Maureen Nash is going to talk a little bit more about this in a couple of weeks. Um, but you're you are treating a you're you're treating a psychotic feature, and oftentimes you can get by with an extremely low dose, maybe 6.25 milligrams of quetiapine or 0.25 milligrams of risperidone, and that will just calm down the the hallucination enough to relieve distress. Um, Divalproic acid or Depakote is is a drug that does get used sometimes for behavioral disturbances of dementia. Um, I can't remember if Maureen's got some slides on that in her talk or if she sticks only with the antipsychotics. But it's got some mixed research behind it. There are definitely some randomized controlled trials showing that it can help control erratic behavior in patients with dementia. So sometimes if you've got a patient who is aggressive and particularly seems to have kind of easy triggers towards aggression, a mood stabilizer such as um, diabetes the Depakote, or even, believe it or not, Trazodone, um, can give some mild um, mood stabilizing properties that just help kind of calm those 
and allow the person to be cared for by their caregivers because of course the most important um, reason to use any of those drugs is if the patient is not safe or the patient is not safe in their environment and at risk of harming another but if they've got Charles Bonnet disease if they've got if, if it's truly a psychotic feature a visual hallucination that is distressing I'm probably going to stick with my very low doses of antipsychotics and often have excellent effectiveness with those. Okay. <clears throat> Another question. You mentioned prescribing an antipsychotic at the same time as an antidepressant while waiting for the antidepressant to take effect. How effective is this in treating depression and how long would you recommend, recommend giving the antipsychotic? Yeah as a last resort but every once in a while somebody with dementia and depression gets is so acutely distressed that I I I see them and I feel so sorry for them and I feel so sorry for their family um, and I know that if I start them on sertraline we're really not going to see any response for at least five to seven days and won't see a marked response for a number of weeks longer than that and so I will use again just that baby dose maybe point or 6.25 milligrams of quetiapine in the evening to help just help kind of give them some extra relief of distress it does have a little bit of anticholinergic properties I think Dr. Nash is the one who likes to call quetiapine baby Benadryl because it's got a little bit of anticholinergic properties to it so it, it is a nice um, it is a nice sleep aid if you end up using it and and please don't get me wrong here I do not use this in most situations but sometimes the sometimes the distress is so severe that using that baby dosage can be valuable and if a patient has most of their distress during daytime hours um, risperidone is not as sedating and 0.25 milligrams might be enough to just calm the agitation I had a, a lady who very quickly for some reason um, started grabbing a kitchen knife and trying to stab her husband with a kitchen knife and this was one example you know when we sorted it out she'd been more tearful she'd been more um, you know she'd been lying in bed more didn't want to get out of bed so I thought the underlying disorder was a depression but I, I really didn't want that kitchen knife to go into her husband's chest and so what we did is just risperidone 0.25 milligrams in the morning and I stopped it after two weeks on the sertraline and she did not have any more episodes of that happening so one to two weeks hopefully is the longest you would need to use that low dose but once in a while you've got features of a depression or an anxiety disorder that are so significant that you really have to use something so I just want people to be aware that I you know occasionally that is something that I that I have tried and found to be very very valuable in managing these patients this is an interesting question how would you approach someone or family members requesting medical marijuana for behaviors or pain? Um, it's a great question and I'm getting it I'm getting uh, p family members particularly patients too but not usually my demented patients um, but family members uh, more and more are saying could we just try this on mom and uh, sadly there just isn't evidence for the use of medical marijuana in dementia I hope somebody's doing the trials I hope the NIH will support the trials um, you know the evidence from HIV and some other diseases for effectiveness in symptom management makes me think that there this might be possible down the line um, if anything I I tell people I'm sorry that I can't give them good research evidence and I would be highly suspicious of side effects and adverse events in an older adult but if they know that you know their mom had used marijuana in the past and she would tolerated it okay and she would kind of enjoyed it and you know she's maybe got some back pain or something that's you know causing her symptoms it's possible that a little bit of marijuana salve on her back might be valuable I I, I try to use I try to recommend people not use it orally but you know just use a salve or some other formula that's going to be you know not um, taken in systematically as well but 
I really I I back away from making a very strong recommendation about it because I just I just don't think the evidence exists and if people you know people are going to try it if they're going to try it I'm I'm, I'm probably not going to convince them not to but um, if if somebody really wants to give it a try I I at least try to steer them away from an oral or an inhalation route and steer them and steer them towards a a cream or a salve or something something like that. Okay. <clears throat> How do you differentiate between apathy and withdrawal from dementia for depression? That's very challenging. Um, so apathy is one of the characteristics of dementia, particularly in the early stage. Um, but people who are apathetic tend to not want to get off the couch but if you convince them to get off the couch, they'll enjoy what they're doing. So, you know, this is the person with an, a little bit earlier stage dementia who's just kind of irritable and punchy and just wants to sit around and not do much and isn't very interested in interacting. But if you get him out and you get him doing something that he enjoys, maybe you take him on a fishing trip or something, he then becomes joyful during that trip and, and you know can show that he is enjoying his time, enjoying the people he's with. Um, that's apathy. Uh, depression is you get, you know, he wants to sit on the couch and then you finally convince him to go out and do something and he still doesn't have fun. And you know, that's a true depression. So I kind of I kind of mark it by that. You know, if you can get them out and doing something, will they enjoy it? Versus no matter what you get them to do, they still they still complain that they hate it and, and they're miserable. Um, one question about what are your thoughts on Seroquel? Yeah, so quetiapine is the other name for Seroquel and I'm sorry I should have used the brand name um, earlier because not everybody goes by generics and you can see from my own talk that I jump back and forth a little But um, Seroquel, the other name is that, that is the one that I've talked a little bit about um, using as a low-dose evening antipsychotic if there's a really distressing psychotic symptom. It is the one I use more commonly. Um, it's probably the only one that's at all safe for Lewy body dementia. So a lot of our patients who have dementia and then have psychotic features, um, hallucinations, uh, paranoia delusions you you want to be concerned that it might not be just an Alzheimer's disease it might be a Lewy body dementia which also has Parkinson's with it um, and so in pa in patients like that it's really dangerous to use haloperidol you want to stay away from the um, kind of the earlier antipsychotic drugs and if you really need to use an antipsychotic for a psychotic feature then you probably your safest bet is the Seroquel or Quetiapine. And um, I, I mentioned earlier that 6.25 to 12.5 milligram dose is often an effective dose for those patients and you often do not have to go above that dosage. Um, so that's that's a that's a choice that if you if you need to get into the antipsychotics, it is probably the one I use most frequently. And I think Dr. Nash is going to talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, looks like we um, one one more question, and that is, how do we get more information about treating dementia with behaviors um, in a non-pharmacological way? Well, if you hadn't haven't heard Liz's talk yet, um, pull that webinar up and listen to it. She does a great job. She has lots of suggestions. Um, um, the Alzheimer's Association does have some information about this. And then um, Oregon Care Partners, I believe they're called, Jan, you probably have the right name, um, is another group that's been doing um, discussions around the state. And their discussion level is more at the patient and caregiver level. So be um, kind of directed not towards health professionals, but more towards family and caregivers. I have to say, though, that their talks are fantastic. And I learn things when I hear them. And you know, I think a lot of our team members um, can get valuable information from the Oregon Care Partners talks. So I would, you know, talk with them and maybe even they might be able to um, do some talks that are a little bit more health professional directed. I think we need a lot. We, you know, we definitely need 
people, all of our staff in long-term care facilities, we need them to have, you know, lots of hours of information on non-pharmacologic strategies for behavior management in dementia. So the more we can kind of get this stuff out there to people who are doing frontline care, um, the better we are. And I, there does need to be more. The other thing I would mention is a book called Help is Here. Um, if anybody um, hasn't heard of that book yet. It was uh, written by Dr. Marian Hodges, who is a geriatrician at Providence, and by Ann Hill, who the daughter of a patient with dementia. And they've now got two versions of the Help is Here. One of the versions is for caregivers of patients with dementia, and the other is for like facility staff members. Um, who are caring for a lot of patients with dementia and you can I think if you google it you'll get there but um, they have a website for that help for help is here and it's not an expensive book I think it might be twenty dollars or something and um, I would encourage people to use that it's a it's a great hands-on um, you know great strategy for managing behavioral symptoms in dementia okay um, we probably have time for one more question, and that is uh, what is the medication for sexual impulsivity which is placing them at risk? What is, what is the indication or what do I do about it? Okay, it, says, it just asks, what about medication for sexual... Oh, what about medications? Yeah, yeah. okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure any geriatrician or geropsychiatrist would want to be recorded foundation for medications for this symptom, but we probably all use some sertraline to quell the sexual disturbances that go along with dementia. Um, it has not been studied. It is not FDA approved for that use. Um, but patients who have depression and have um, sexual aggression, um, sertraline is probably your best choice, first line drug for that anyway, and it does have some pretty potent um, kind of sexual questions. So that's, that's been the drug that I have found to be effective in my patients with dementia and depression and who are exhibiting sexual, sexually aggressive and um, dangerous behaviors. Okay. There, <clears throat> there is um, one question, um, and I think this will be the uh, last one uh, due to time. This is, our long-term care facilities are underpaid, leading to incredible turnover. How are you using non-pharmacological measures in this constantly rotating staff situation? Yeah. Um, so I have to preface that by saying I don't do much work in long-term care myself. I have lots of patients who are in long-term care. Most of them come to me. I go out to facilities once in a while, um, but you know Liz is the one who spends all of her time there, and we might want to try to have some more kind of future work around this topic. Incredibly important topic. Um, I certainly have found, as I work with um, care providers for my patients who are in long-term care, that having them Having the staff really engaged in doing non-pharmacologic strategies like music therapy and back rubs and all of the little things that are so kind and gentle um, actually help retain staff. I think if if they have if they are given a little bit of time during the day to do something like you know share a give a back um, do some music therapy together those kinds of things. I think that that can be can make their day positive. They'll see more smiles from their residents. Um, they'll see more, you know, more relaxation. They'll see that way. Giving staff time to do some of those things can really enhance their pleasure and their ability to stay in a role. And if if facilities 
can really be thoughtful about allowing that time instead of just changing the bedpan and just cleaning up the messes and just trying to get the patient to bathe when that patient hasn't wanted to bathe for the last three years. Those things are all so frustrating to staff. But if there's a culture at the facility where the all of the staff are, are given the role to provide these non-pharmacologic behaviors, it's going to make everybody's life so much more pleasurable that I think it's, it is a, a good step towards staff retention. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> um, we're just going to think uh, we've answered all of the questions. Anyway, we thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed it, gained valuable positively in people living with dementia. If the about we sent short every night and so you can go